Hello everyone. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Chris. I gotta crack that beer. Okay. So this was not a request. This is uh is it Jardine Matheson? How Opium Wars founded Hong Kong. This was their uh Kings and Generals has like a what was it? Not villains. Crime syndicates. So, oh, let's get this. Let's get this all comfortable. Get some. Get your beer. I got cheap beer, but it's okay because it gets me to where I need to go. So let's get on with the video. In the year 1841, the Union Jack was raised proudly over a barren little rock off the coast of Guangzhou. To many Chinese, this moment embodied their greatest shame. Their celestial kingdom had been cursed by a little poppy flower, whose ambrosial resin spread rot and decay throughout every level of their society. China was helpless to stop the Westerners from flooding their nation with this opium and claiming Chinese land for their own. As dawn rose over the British Crown colony of Hong Kong, one man stood responsible for all this. He was William Jardine, one of the biggest drug lords of all time and the opium king of China. We live in the information age, which means that okay. the protection of our personal data and information is of the utmost importance. The sponsor of this video Thanks, sponsor of the video. In the late 18th century, China, ruled by the Imperial Qing Dynasty, was the wealthiest nation on earth, controlling 65% of global GDP, wow. and its luxury products were considered second to none. For as long as Europeans had known about the Celestial Kingdom, they had craved its treasures, namely porcelain, silk, and most of all, tea. tea. However, China had been closed off since the 15th century, allowing only incredibly limited interactions with the outside world. Hmm. In 1757... Was that um, on their, by their own choice, just to limit who they did business with and stuff like that? Which, you know, sounds smart. <clears throat> the Changlong Emperor decreed that any Westerners seeking trade with China had to do it at the southern port of Canton, isolating the potentially troublesome foreigners to one area. Okay. Furthermore, a conglomerate of wealthy Chinese merchant houses, collectively known as the Kohong, was given a government monopoly over foreign trade, allowing them to tax, tariff and regulate European traders. Out of all the colonial powers, it was the British whose desire for Chinese products was the greatest. Their national megacorporation, the Honourable East India Company, had founded a factory in Canton in 1771, but business was far from harmonious. By 1800, the company was importing more than 20 million pounds of dried tea leaf per year. Before long, some 10% of the average... 20 million pounds of dried tea leaf. Dried tea leaf is not heavy. That's a lot of goddamn tea. If you really think of it that way, that's like... That's like, I mean, it's, it's probably heavier than cotton, but it's, that's light. That's a lot of tea. <laughs> Rich British household income was being spent on imported tea alone. Britain had no real products that China was interested in, and thus had to sink piles upon piles of silver to get Chinese goods. The empire's coffers were being drained dry by Chinese trade. It is here that we must begin the story of our main character. You can't you can't fault China if you don't have anything that they want. You can't just take what you want for free. You know, and then you got to give them something and maybe they wanted the silver. So I mean, if you don't have anything to give them, yeah, it's going to cost you. Trade would probably work better, but it is going to cost you. It's going to cost you regardless. Who's William Jardine you? was born in 1784 on a small farm near Lochmaben, Scotland, under the shadow of the old castle of Robert the Bruce. 
His family was poor and struggled, but the boy was clever, so in the year 1800, his family saved up enough money to send him to the prestigious University of Edinburgh, where he would study to become a surgeon. Upon graduation, Jardine was hired as an employee of the East India Company, enlisting as a surgeon's mate aboard the RCS Brunswick. Thus, this 18-year-old Scotsman set off for China for the first time. After a long journey, the Brunswick arrived at Wampoa, a town some 12 miles downriver of Canton. It was a whole new world, and Jardine was immersed in the bustle of clanging gongs, crackling fireworks, and the Chinese river peoples plying the water lanes in their sampans. Over the next decade, Jardine made many journeys to China aboard company vessels. He quickly found that life as a company man was perilous. In 1805, Jardine's ship was captured by a Napoleonic warship and wrecked off the coast of South Africa. He managed to find passage back to England, but in 1809, his new vessel narrowly evaded a fleet of Chinese pirates led by Chang Pao. Nevertheless, where there is danger, there is always opportunity. During the first year of Jardine's tenure as a surgeon, the East India Company had found a dubious way to erase their trade deficit. It was, of course, opium. The product that grew in the British territory of Bengal was the highest quality in the world and incredibly addictive. It was this addiction that would generate Chinese demand for the product. Opium was illegal in China, and the East India Company did not want to jeopardize their foothold in Canton by engaging openly in forbidden trade. So, instead of importing the drug into China themselves, they produced it en masse in their factories in Bengal and sold it to private Indian agencies, who then passed the product to unscrupulous smugglers who would sneak it into China and return with the profits. This was a big deal. Yeah, it, I would it's say it's a miracle big deal. Dog. Like I would say it was a big deal. <laughs> Using smugglers to get drugs in there. Can you imagine any of this stuff being done today? It probably is. What this was a big deal, as formerly the East India Company had held a government-mandated monopoly on all British trade going to China. By allowing private traders to do business for them, they put their own fate in jeopardy. The temptation to strike out as a legally mandated drug trafficker was all too tempting to many company employees who were willing to sacrifice moral integrity to get rich quick. In 1817, he left the East India Company. Entering into a business partnership with some old acquaintances, he managed to purchase his first ship, the Sarah. In 1819, the Scotsman sailed for Bombay, where he was reunited with an old friend, Jamseji Jejiboy, an Indian merchant of Zoroastrian Parsi extraction. Jejiboy had been aboard the Brunswick with Jardine when it was boarded by the French back in 1805. Now he was the head of one of Bombay's largest opium agencies, and Jardine's main supplier of opium for many years to come. Jardine and his associates became one of the more well-known opium cliques in the East. With each successful smuggling run, more partners joined, bringing with them ships, men and assets. But among all of them, only one, a fellow Scotsman, would truly be Jardine's equal. James Matheson was an aspiring businessman in the employ of a wealthy Portuguese merchant, to whom he was something of an adopted son. When the latter died, Matheson inherited his ships and joined Jardine's growing fleet of smugglers. Matheson was every bit as cunning, ambitious and wholly amoral as his new partner, and soon the two Scotsmen became the most dynamic duo on the South China Sea. In 1832, they restructured their business and co-founded the company known as Jardine Mathesons & Co. A year later, the British Parliament finally revoked the East India Company's trade monopoly, allowing Jardine and Matheson to fill the power vacuum. Smuggling illegal drugs onto the coast of a highly isolationist nation was a dangerous affair and required intelligence, skill and a great deal of luck. For Jardine Mathesons, the process usually began in India, where the Scotsmen acquired massive amounts of opium from their Parsi suppliers. The product was transported back to China aboard clippers. These cutting-edge modern sailing ships were capable of outpacing even steam-powered vessels. 
The Chinese wow. demand for opium meant that there were always native buyers, and prominent smuggling hubs soon developed in the ports of Wampoa, Macau, and Linton. To get around Chinese laws, British drug lords anchored large cargo ships offshore, which served as floating depots where they stored the opium. This allowed them to technically argue that they weren't selling opium on Chinese soil. Pretty much everyone saw this fast for what it was, but centuries of isolation meant that the Qing government had no real navy to speak of and was powerless to deal with the superior firepower of the British clippers. Additionally, the drug trade had corrupted every level of Chinese society, and there were more than enough officials willing to turn a blind eye in exchange for bribes. Ironically, the Kohong, which was specifically tasked to contain European influence, had become the key accomplice in the drug trade. From the floating depots, Chinese smugglers would buy opium in bulk in exchange for a bullion of silver, then store the drug in speedy crafts known as fast crabs and scrambling dragons, and sail them up the shallow riverways of China, disseminating the addictive product throughout the nation. Meanwhile, the British traders would take their silver and use it to purchase precious tea from the Kohong in Canton, which they then shipped back home. Jardine never questioned... If anybody heard that, sorry, my phone buzzed, and when I clicked on it, because it had a little message, it just started playing things. And I was like, that's why I said, what's happening? Sorry. My apologies. And the ethics of his business. Before long, the illegal smuggling of him and his competitors had created a nationwide health epidemic. The productivity of Chinese society tanked, as everyone from the lowest of peasants to the emperor's own palace guards could be found wasting away in hidden drug dens. The addiction was so dire that poor villages that had no rice to feed their people still ran opium stores to feed their morbid addiction. Wow. Between 1834 to 1841, Jardine Matheson's fleet grew into 19 great clippers and hundreds of smaller lurcher boats, more than any other private trading company in China. The pair had become impossibly wealthy, but now they were at the top, the challenge was to stay there and Jardine was careful to cultivate an aura of authority around himself so that none would challenge him. He operated his drug empire out of an office in Canton, known as the Creek Hung. In it there was only one chair, his own. Visitors were not allowed to sit in the presence of Jardine, stressing the importance of his time. One anecdote tells a story that once while Jardine was on a business trip at the gates of Canton, a local Chinese, contemptuous of the foreign devils, struck him hard over the head with a piece of timber. Jardine did not even flinch at the blow and continued on his way as if nothing had happened. For this incident, he was nicknamed by the locals as the Iron-Headed Old Rat. <laughs> at this point, I got a feeling nothing good is going to come from that man who struck him on the head. Come on. Oh, really? I didn't know anything about... I'm, look, I'm American, so I didn't know anything about this uh, whole smuggling ring. I've heard of the, you know, the, the opium wars, but I didn't realize, really, you want to stop playing now? But I didn't realize... Uh, what did I not realize? That it that opium was profitable? Of course I knew that. I didn't know who was in charge of it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. At this point, every other trader in Canton referred to Jardine as the Taipan, a Chinese term roughly translating to Supreme Leader or the Big Shot. By Isn't there a snake? A Taipan snake? Or is the snake called the Taipan? Am I Never mind. By 1838, the number of Chinese addicts was estimated to be anywhere from 4 to 12 million, largely a legacy of his influence. It seemed as if there was no one in China capable of stopping the illegal drug empire. That is, until the arrival of Lin Zexu. Lin Zexu was a special imperial commissioner acting on behalf of the Daoguang Emperor, 
who had ordered him to put an end to China's opium crisis by any means necessary. An incredibly well-respected figure, he was known to his people as Blue Sky, who considered him as pure and incorruptible as the heavens. One of Lin's first tactics was to appeal directly to the top. In 1838, he wrote an imploring letter to Queen Victoria, appealing to her sense of morality by highlighting the damage her citizens had done to China. The commissioner hoped that his words would move the young monarch into putting a stop to the opium trade, but she never received the letter. Oh. Getting no response, Lin decided it was time to lay down an iron fist. Within only a few months, he had arrested 1,700 Chinese opium dealers and confiscated 70,000 opium pipes. Terrified of the imperial commissioner, the Hong merchants pleaded with the British traders in Canton to give up their product, but they refused to do so. Lin responded to this by effectively laying siege to the foreign quarter of Canton, surrounding it with troops and isolating it from the outside world. He went so far as to cut off their food and water supply and have his men endlessly bang huge gongs so as to keep the merchants deprived of sleep. Oh, wow. Present at this showdown was Matheson, who insisted that his fellow drug lords should refuse to capitulate, convinced that Lin was bluffing. Fortunately, a new arrival would calm the rising tensions. <clears throat> the British Chief Superintendent of Trade, Charles Elliott, regarded the opium trade with disdain and wished to prevent all-out war from brewing over the drug. To that end, he confiscated all the opium in Canton from the British traders, while promising the merchants that they would be compensated for their loss. The opium was then turned over to Lin Zexu, who had it all destroyed in bonfires. For their compliance, the Honourable Mandarin supplied 250 cattle to the starving merchants. Elliot and Lin's negotiations came very close to preventing a crisis, but the former hadn't the authority to promise that the British government would compensate the traders for their now incinerated product, and back in England, Parliament refused to pony up, no, insisting no. instead that the Chinese government had to compensate the traders. After all, it had been them who torched the goods. Every opium runner in China had just lost incalculable amounts, and they weren't getting it back. They wanted compensation, and they wanted war. To accomplish this, they turned to the greatest among them, the Taipan, Jardin. Jardin was incensed at the destruction of his property. For several years he had entertained the idea of provoking a war between Britain and China. Now he considered it a necessity. In September of 1839, Jardin arrived in London, where he started lobbying with the Secretary of British Foreign Affairs, Henry John Temple, Viscount of Palmerston. The Scottish drug lord impressed upon Palmerston the necessity of war. He knew the coastlines of China better than any Briton, and in a missive known as the Jardine Paper, he laid out a detailed plan for victory. This included a detailed battle strategy, and how many men and ships would be required to carry it out. Jardine wished to force the Daoguang Emperor to make three concessions. Firstly, the financial value of all the opium Lin Zexu had burned would be compensated in full. Secondly, the Canton system and the Kohong would be abolished, and four additional Chinese ports, Fuzhou, Ningbo, Shanghai and Xiamen, would be open to British trade. Thirdly, and most importantly, an island off the coast of China had to be ceded to the British Crown, a permanent base where British companies could operate under British law rather than suffer under stringent Chinese commissioners like Lin Zexu. Jardin had a few suggestions on where this new colony should be, but he had his heart set on one in particular, a barren little rock just off the Kowloon Peninsula in Guangzhou. Jardin, Mathesons and co. had used the island to smuggle opium in the past, and the Taipan knew that it had a naturally protected harbour. It was the perfect trading hub. Known to the fishermen who lived there as the Fragrant Harbour, this island was, of course, Hong Kong. Hmm. Soon, Lord Palmerston caved under Jardine's pressure, and the British Empire finally declared war on China. It was a quick and one-sided affair. Chinese spears, bows and matchlock muskets were no match for the cutting-edge British firepower, 
while the Imperial Qing armies were losing manpower, with many of its soldiers frail from opium, the very drug that had led them into the war in the first place. Relying largely upon the war plans drawn out by Jardine, the British had all but won the First Opium War by 1841. The iron-headed old rat had come out on top, and all of his war goals were achieved. Meanwhile, Lin Zexu was scapegoated for China's loss. Considered responsible for the Celestial Kingdom's great humiliation, he was exiled to remote Xinjiang. For Jardine, Hong Kong was the ultimate prize, a culmination of his many years of hard labour. Once it had been officially ceded to Britain, he and Matheson quickly set to work, turning the bleak rock into the great colonial entrepot of the East. It was not a smooth transition, as typhoons and fires sabotaged early construction, malaria ravaged its settlers, and seaborne piracy was rampant. Nevertheless, the Scottish partners pushed on, continuing to be major promoters of the struggling island. Matheson established their company's new head office on the island's east point in 1842, while warehouses, wharves and houses were built to accommodate the firm's business operations and employees. Hong Kong quickly turned into a boom town, doubling in population from 7,000 to 15,000 within its first year. While it wow. would be untrue to say that Jardine Matheson's and co were the sole driving force behind Hong Kong's success, it is unlikely that the tiny colony would have become the booming city it is today without the investment of the Scottish drug lords. At some point in 1842, William Jardine became afflicted with cancer. He continued to run his trading empire through his sickness, but on February 27, 1843, the great Taipan passed away at the age of 59. The crown colony of Hong Kong continued to flourish, especially as a centre for a newly resurgent opium trade, which the Chinese were now doubly helpless to stop. Following Jardine's death, the business was helmed at first by James Matheson and later by their descendants. As the fragrant harbour evolved from a colonial frontier into one of the world's most bustling trade cities, the descendants of William Jardine were always there at the centre of it all, each of them bearing the title of Taipan as their ancestor had. Today, Jardine Matheson Holdings Limited is Hong Kong's largest private employer, second only to the government. A worldwide corporation, it has subsidiaries in cars, insurance, real estate, hygiene products and hotels, among others. Wow. From these lofty peaks, we must not forget the humble origins and troubled history of Jardine Matheson's, which ultimately is the story of a peasant boy in the Scottish lowlands whose endless ambition saw him slowly become one of the most infamous drug lords of all time, and in doing so, forever changing the face of the Chinese world. We always have more stories to tell, so make sure... Anybody have any idea what, what he was worth? I mean, according to, you know, his time and then if it can be translated to today. That's crazy. That's how, that's how the British got Hong Kong. I didn't know that. That's crazy. And even though the whole, even though, you know, Jardine Matheson, they have a company there today. That's ridiculous. But like Matheson, I mean, no real mention of him in this. This is more like, this is more Jardine's story. There should be a movie about this. I don't think it'd play well in China, but I think the rest of the world would find it interesting. I don't know if the British would find it too interesting. <laughs> You're making us look, they would, they would, they would want to change. No, no, no. China forced us to bring opium in. <laughs> We were just doing a service. Wow, that's crazy. That's very cool. Very interesting. I didn't know that. Hmm. Wow. All right. This is this is really good. All right, I'm going to end this here. And um, like and subscribe. Yeah, have a good day. Have a good night.